this evening, I thought to speak about wealth. I know that's a topic that no one is really concerned with. <laughs> of course, so many persons are greedy for wealth, and many persons are in denial about it. Oh, I never think about it. It doesn't mean much to me. <laughs> Nevertheless, wealth, particularly money, occupies such a central role in our contemporary life. Today, we want to consider what is the real wealth that we should be acquiring. Those of you who have read Bhagavad Gita know that another name for Arjuna is Dhananjaya, one who is victorious in getting wealth. But we need to think what kind of wealth is actually Arjuna's mainstay. Yes, it is true that on behalf of his brother Yudhisthira, Arjuna gathered some wealth so that Yudhisthira Maharaj could perform an extraordinarily opulent sacrifice, the Rajasuya Yantra. The purpose of Yudhisthira Maharaj performing this preeminent Vedic sacrifice was to broadcast to everyone, to demonstrate to everyone that Krishna, who was on the planet at the time, visible. He wanted to demonstrate that Krishna is no ordinary person. And he wanted to clarify the difference between <coughs> serving anyone else and serving Krishna. So Arjuna's brother, Yudhisthira, was a very proactive government leader in terms of providing his citizens with the prime necessities of life. This was the Eudistere Care Program. How to give the best for the spiritual development of the population that he's managing. To fulfill his brother's requirements for this extraordinary baby young opulence beyond what we can imagine, Arjuna acquired some wealth. Nevertheless, Arjuna's real treasure and what is presented in Bhagavad Gita is beyond any kind of wealth available in the material world. And through Bhagavad Gita, that same wealth is available to us all. So we can envision Arjuna's name, Jananjaya, on two levels. Yes, he obtained material wealth. But most importantly for us, Arjuna had for himself the riches of Krishna Bhakti, pure devotional service to Krishna. And by receiving Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is making that inestimable wealth available to us. Let's talk about what it could be like if any of you were wealthy, very wealthy, in the material sense. Believe it or not, there was a theory around the turn of the 20th century that once wealthy persons get a certain level of wealth, they lose interest in making any more money, <laughs> and instead they devote their time to philanthropy, to culture, to philosophy. That was a theory 100 years ago. Obviously the theory didn't work out. 
Because there's something about trying to fulfill your material desires that simply leads to more material desires. This is the trick of the illusory energy. And in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that that illusory energy belongs to him. In Sanskrit, Krishna says, Mamamaya Drakya. He's telling Arjuna, and through Arjuna, Krishna's telling the world, I have an energy of illusion, and it's practically impossible to overcome unless you hear from me and you follow my instructions. So this never-ending cycle of one desire leading to another desire. How are we going to get out of that? How are we going to escape that? Another term for it, a fancy sociological term for this phenomenon, is called the hedonic treadmill, or the hedonistic treadmill. You're running and running on the treadmill, and you're exerting energy, but you never get anywhere. Similarly, as we try to fulfill one material desire, a thousand or more material desires appear. So this idea that I'll get sufficiently rich and sufficiently wealthy that I'll lose interest in getting more money doesn't, doesn't work. So that theory has been discarded. Then there was the idea that more money leads to more leisure time. And earlier in the 20th century, it was a status symbol to have leisure time. Supposedly in that leisure time, you would devote yourself to the arts to charity, maybe become a writer or something like that. What has happened today? It's an amazing phenomenon that's happened today. Those who are wealthy work longer hours than those who are poor. Now why is that? As the division of wealth, the gap, in terms of the inequality of wealth. As that widens, you see that those who are making the big money, they see that the more time that I would spend on my job or my business, the more rewards can come my way. Time is money. I'm making big money now, but I can't afford to take any time out because I could be losing big And there's another reason why if you're very wealthy, you'll have less leisure time. It's because the feeling of power, the feeling of control, the feeling of creativity that you get in terms of manipulating the material world seems to be far more satisfying than being at home and struggling with your relationships at home. So many wealthy persons say that they would rather be at work than at home because home is such a struggle, relationships are such a struggle. Whereas you put all your energies into work and you can feel like you are the controller, the master, the manipulator. <clears throat> so for all these reasons, if indeed you are wealthy, most likely, you're working longer hours than someone who doesn't have any money. But it's said that if you're one of those who has a menial job, a low-paying job, still you get your reward. What is that? Thanks to modern entertainment technology you can have so-called high-quality, cheap entertainment in your own little apartment or home. <laughs> so therefore, you're not working as hard as a rich person, but you have ready access to endless television programs, and your days and nights will be filled. So what has happened is that Leisure time is now looked down upon. It's 
unproductive. If you have leisure time, it means you're useless. You should be making big money. If you have more money, you should be making still more money. Again and again, is that society is totally blind. People have lost sight of what is the real goal in life. And for a bhakti yogi, for a Krishna conscious person, this is very tragic to see on a mass scale people wasting their valuable human form of life. If they're rich, they're working harder than them. Because yeah, in today's globalistic economy, you could be making big money, more than what you already have. If you just come up with the right innovation, you can affect the whole world. And then, if you don't have much money, if you're poor, you've got the TV, you've got the internet. <laughs> like, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> So you see that everyone is trapped, rich or poor. No one knows how to use their time to attain the ultimate goal of life. And that ultimate goal of life is described by Krishna and Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter as the greatest gain. So much so that even in material difficulty, you'll never let go of that greatest gain. This is what the forward-thinking human being should aspire for. What is the greatest wealth? What is the greatest acquisition? That is what Krishna is offering through the bhakti process. He's asking you, connect with me. There's nothing better in life than that. So it's up to us to take Krishna's proposal and apply it and get the results. Krishna's not asking you to have religious belief in him. Krishna is asking you to connect with him. Just like a father asking the child, please depend on me, take shelter in me. Let's consider some other aspects of material wealth. Social scientists have pointed out that, you know, if you haven't been to Kolkata, you've probably seen in the movies. They have these persons who, mm, they pull these rickshaws, these carriages with persons sit, seated on, and the guy, goes at a trap, taking persons from one destination to another. Social scientists have done research and established that that guy in Kolkata, who's just trotting around all day with his rickshaw, his carriage, carrying people from here to there, he's as happy as the average American. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, how could that be? And then we consider how beyond a basic middle class standard of wealth and luxury and convenience, any further increase in income or luxury does not lead to an increase in material happiness, no matter how you measure it. I was speaking about this uh, in South Africa, University of Johannesburg. Because there you have a situation in which 20 years after the fall of apartheid, the people are primed to get their share of the Western dream. So I explained to them. I said, haven't you heard the research that any increase in your wealth, your luxury, 
beyond a basic middle class standard living does not lead to an increase in your happiness? Everyone, raise your hand. Yes, we've heard about this. I was speaking to illustrious students and their professors. So I asked them, all right, you've heard about it. You're knowledgeable academics. But tell me, how many of you here are prepared to just accept a basic middle class standard of life? No one raised their hand. So just see the disconnect. They know, but still, the mind is agitated by so many material desires. They want their fair share of consumerism. Now let's consider ourselves. What is it that we want to achieve in our life? Everyone says, oh, money can't make you happy. Money can't buy happiness. But meanwhile, you see everyone in anxiety about money. You see everyone pursuing money. So there's a disconnect between what we say and what we do. And especially, you can see through statistics that people are working harder than ever before, working more hours. Middle class, upper class, they're all working on it. So what to do about this? How to see the situation through the lens of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the prime bhakti yoga text? You'll find in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam a very clear principle. Don't go to work in order to get. Perform your occupational duty in order to give. What? What could that mean? <laughs> I spoke about this point at the business school, University of Toronto, Rockland School of <coughs> Business and Management. The audience was full of professors and MBA students. So, how is it that you go to work not to get? Well, we all know that practically no one will go to work if you don't get paid. You're hoping that the financial rewards of the work will allow you to get what you want. But Srimad Bhagavatam advises you to go to work in order to give. And what exactly should you give? Give yourself a spiritual lifestyle. Give yourself a Krishna conscious lifestyle. And after first dealing with that necessity to give it to yourself, then you give it to your family and give it to as many persons in the world as your resources allow. This is the Bhagavatam principle. Don't work for your own gratification. Use your occupation as a springboard for freedom from material existence and the ultimate connection. The ultimate connection means serving Krishna with pure love and devotion. Your work can actually bring that about, just as in Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is working, meaning he's engaging in his occupational duty. In the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna didn't want to discharge his occupation. He gave many excuses because the circumstances were very harrowing, very stressful. But Krishna persuaded him on many levels to engage his occupation. And Krishna gave him the focus. Mama Nusma Yujam Cha. Krishna told him, fight and think of me. You're a military man. There's a way to discharge your military duty and be completely focused on me. So through Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is showing you the possibilities for occupations. How indeed to go to work, to give. What a different mentality this is. It's actually liberation. If you use your job, as a vehicle to give yourself the spiritual necessities and provide 
those spiritual necessities to your family. And then, of course, what about the world? Help as much of the world as you can, as your resources allow, through your work. In that way, you'll go to work being enlivened. It's very miserable being selfish. Okay, I'm going to work today. Soon I'll be able to get this, I'll be able to get that. Not simply for me, but for persons who are dear to me. <laughs> and I'll give a little bit in charity, of course. <laughs> That's not what Baba Tom is talking about. Shiva Baba is presenting in depth what the Bhagavad Gita is introducing. How your occupation can connect to Krishna in such a way that you get maximum spiritual benefit. In this way, you're, you transform your life through your occupation. In order to do this, we have to understand who actually is the proprietor of the fruits of our economic activity. This principle is what bewilders the world today. In other words, we're not talking about whether an economic system is capitalism or socialism. No, we're looking at who is the enjoyer of the fruits. If you say, the individual is the enjoyer of the fruits. You're wrong. If you say the state is the enjoyer of the fruits, you're wrong. Bhagavad Gita points out that Krishna is the enjoyer of all activities. The, the devotee of Krishna, the Bhakti Yogi, can rise above the material world simply by sacrificing the fruits of his or her labor for Krishna. In other words, you're giving to Krishna what doesn't belong to you anyway. <laughs> you're giving to Krishna what belongs to Krishna. Yet, you get complete credit for giving what doesn't belong to you anyway. <laughs> no. What could be more liberating than that? We actually had nothing to renounce. We never had anything in the first place. Can you just see yourself walking down Venice Boulevard? I think there's a Chase Bank down that way, just a little bit. And you're walking with your friends, you're driving by in your car, and you turn to your family or friends and say, see that bank there? I renounce it. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think your family and friends are going to say? Are you crazy? Uh, what does it matter? You renounce the bank. It's not yours. <laughs> so similarly, if we learn through proper knowledge that everything belongs to Krishna, even our own body and mind, then we understand there's nothing to be proud about when we so-called renounce something. We're actually through the bhakti process, using what belongs to Krishna for the pleasure of Krishna. And even though it belongs to Krishna, we get credit for using everything, using Krishna's energy for his pleasure. So this is the ingenious way to live. How to truly rise above a selfish lifestyle? We have to recognize who is the ultimate proprietor. It's nice in a very elementary way to say, God is the Lord of everything. But how actually do we act on that understanding? Therefore, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that he has different energies. He has a material energy. He has a spiritual energy. All are his energies. And then he teaches you how to use his energies in his service. So this is the liberating advantage 
of bhakti yoga. Arjuna has some confusion in Bhagavad Gita. Isn't a renouncer someone who just sits in meditation and doesn't do any kind of activity? But Krishna explained to him action in Krishna consciousness. How all your activities can be connected to the Supreme Absolute Truth. Those of you who are familiar with the Bible may recall a verse attributed to Jesus in which he says, you should be in the world but not of the world. A simple platitude but actually very high. To truly be in the world but not of the world uh, requires very advanced spiritual technology. It's like telling someone, be immersed in the ocean, but don't get wet. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains exactly how to be in the world, but not of the world. How to use all your activities for the pleasure of the Supreme. And in that way, your activities are totally different from an ordinary person's activities. Although to ordinary vision, the devotee's activities and the non-devotee's activities look the same. One example that Srila Prabhupada gave, if from a distance you see someone flying a kite, you can't tell what difference it makes that the person is winding the string on the stick this way or that way. You can't see the difference. You're too far away. But if you got up close, you'd see that by winding the string around the stick one way, the kite comes down, and by winding it the other way, the kite goes higher in the air. But from a distance, it just the person's doing like this, that, but the kite string, it all looks the same in terms of results. So similarly, as we come closer to the knowledge of the Supreme Absolute Truth, we start to see differences in terms of how people utilize the results of their labor. And Srimad Bhagavatam, the graduate study, the Bhagavad Gita, gets into this point even deeper. The first chapter, Shri Bhagavatam explains. You are entitled to work, but what is the purpose of work? If we understand the true purpose of work, we won't be miserable anymore. Because the selfish life is indeed miserable. I'm going to get for me. And not only for me, but bodies that are near and dear to me. This is miserable. Shrimad Bhagavatam opens up the whole issue of work and shows you how to use your work to achieve perfection. This is the unique advantage of bhakti yoga. You don't have to think of going off and living in a cave, going off and living on top of a mountain in seclusion. You can't do that anyway. So, the intelligent person is concerned with his or her lifestyle. I'm reading Bhagavad Gita. I'm seeing the exhortations to be a yogi, as Krishna tells Arjuna, tasma yogi bhava Arjuna. Arjuna, in all circumstances, be a yogi. Now, who is, who is Krishna talking to? He's not talking to a brahmana, Vedic priest. He's not talking to uh, someone who's living as a sadhu in the ordinary sense. He's not talking to a yogi who's living in a cave or on top of a mountain. He's talking to Arjuna. Arjuna is a family man and he's a military man. And Krishna is telling him, Tasmat yogi bhava Arjuna. In all circumstances, be a yogi. So we should think about that. 
What Krishna is zeroing in on is the fruit of the labor. And therefore he says, whatever you do, whatever actions you do, you do as an offering to me. Once our work takes on the role of an offering to Krishna, we're liberated. We're free from the karmic reactions. Krishna, through Bhagavad Gita, is trying to protect us from reactive work. In other words, the precious commodity being presented in Bhagavad Gita is non-reactive work. How to act in this world without getting any reactions. Who could be more expert than Krishna in teaching this art, science, and culture of non-reactive work? Just look at what Krishna can do. He explains in Bhagavad Gita, Namam Garmani Dhanvanti, Namekam Padeshya. I have nothing to gain in this world. I don't need anything. There are no results that I'm trying to get. An example from nature that the Acharyas give is a rainbow. When you look at a rainbow, it seems that the ends, both ends of the rainbow are resting on the earth. But as you know, you try to find that spot on earth where the rainbow is resting. You can't find it. Similarly, Krishna appears in this world, but he is not touched by this world. That is why Krishna is the supreme expert in teaching how to perform non-reactive work. Because he can appear in this world and he can act, yet there are no material reactions to what he does. He's completely self-sufficient, completely independent, Yet, he appears in this world, he does things. Just like the rainbow appears in this world, but you can't find where the rainbow is actually touching the ground. It just seems to rest on the ground. The ends of the rainbow seem to be touching the earth somewhere. Once we understand Krishna's unique qualifications, then naturally we become interested in hearing from Krishna. This is why Krishna goes to great length in Bhagavad Gita to explain himself. Because if you can understand Krishna and how he acts, even though there are no reactions, then you can see a clear pathway for your own lifestyle. As the Upanishads explain, you are a tiny sample of the Supreme Absolute Truth. The Vedic Injunction is Anor Aniyan Mahato Mahiyam. The Supreme Absolute Truth is smaller than the smallest and greater than the greatest. So Krishna, as himself, the Om Purna, the complete whole, is greater than anything. And that same Krishna, as his part and parcel living entity, is smaller than the smallest. Understanding our tiny position, our tiny status in relation to Krishna. We can see that although our quantity is so tiny, we have the same qualities as Krishna. Therefore, we also have the inherent ability to be free from material action and reaction. The problem, however, is We've forgotten our spiritual nature. We've forgotten how powerful is the spirit soul. And we are relying on the power of our physiology and the power of our psychology. The beginning lessons in Bhagavad Gita given by Krishna to Arjuna are to awaken us to the potential of our spirit soul. 
But that's just the beginning. Krishna's instructions take you beyond that. Because once you understand the power of your real identity as spirit soul, then you want to know what, what is the perfect lifestyle? What are the activities of the spirit soul in perfection? And that's why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Manmana Bhavamad Bhakta Majaji Man Always think of me, become my bhakta, become my devotee. Then you are perfectly situated. Then you are at the top of the yoga ladder. You are engaged in devotional service to Krishna. The intelligent person, intelligent according to Vedic standards, starts to think, how can I engineer my lifestyle for the greatest gain, for the greatest wealth? What you're seeing these days is that rich or poor, no one really knows what to do with their time. As we pointed out in the beginning, the rich are working longer hours. And the poor are working less, but they're using their spare time simply for entertainment. Made so cheaply available through television, through the internet. A former prime minister of New Zealand was telling me, he said, you know, there used to be a time when we politicians were worried about uprisings, that the downtrodden or the poverty stricken or those who had less would at any time cause a huge disturbance. That used to be the worry of political leaders. He said, not anymore. <laughs> We're not worried about that in the slightest. We found out all you do is give the people unlimited television channels, unlimited sports, <laughs> and just forget about it. Everything will be peaceful. So what do you think about that? So the wealthy are endeavoring to get more and more wealth. They're never satisfied. If you hear that someone is a millionaire these days, what do you think? Millionaire, that's nothing. <laughs> you gotta at least have a hundred million, and you're successful. <laughs> if anyone here has material aspirations, it's really not to be a millionaire. I often quote a survey that was done in Silicon Valley. And to qualify for this survey, you had to have three things. You had to have investments worth a million dollars. You had to have a million dollars in cold cash and reserves. And you had to have a house worth more than a million dollars. So, the social scientists doing this research, they found out that in almost every case, someone who qualified by having those three things, they all felt that, I don't have enough. It's nothing. It's not enough to be secure in the world today. A million in cold cash, what is that? It's pocket change. Your position's very shaky. A million dollars worth of investments? Could be wiped out in a second on the stock market. A million dollar house? Oh, so what? Almost all of them felt that they have nothing. They don't have enough. And they were all working at least 70 hours a week. And what was the excuse they gave? I'm not doing this for me. It's for my children. But they're never at home to see their children. <laughs> they love their wife something. <laughs> they're never around. But the excuse they gave is, it's for the children. And then one, 
of those wealthy persons in Silicon Valley uh, expressed himself very emphatically and clearly. He said, look, all right, I got a few million, big deal. But tell me, whether you're wealthy and working harder because a few million's not enough, or you're poor and you're working less, but you're just watching television all day, <laughs> no one knows what to do. So Bhagavad Gita is equally disposed to all classes of humanity. Rich, poor, middle class, the whole point is, what are you doing with your time? That's why it is important to learn the art of work. And that is what Bhagavad Gita is all about. If you can learn how to work in such a way that you get no reactions, then you're free from material existence. And that is what Krishna is inviting you to. He's asking, you work for me. It's all my energy anyway. Nothing is yours. But if you work for me and offer me the results of your activities with devotion, I'll accept. So this is what bhakti is all about. But in our mind, because it's been missing, we think, how is, how is that possible? How is it possible to give to Krishna? I'm just getting by. In a few years, yeah, then I may have something to give, but not yet. We're very paranoid. Who is this Krishna? What does he want? Why does he want it? I remember when I first started reading Bhagavad Gita, a month after I graduated from university, and I read that you offer your food to Krishna, and then you honor the remnants, you eat the remnants. So, I thought, that doesn't sound intelligent to me. Remnants, what that means is you cook some food, and then you, in, you offer the pot of food to Krishna, and then, because it's offered to Krishna, you can't take it. You, throw out what's in the pot and the remnants that cling to the bottom. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> you know, with my Yale education, I had it all figured out. <laughs> the remnants. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Offer your food to Krishna and then you take the remnants? <laughs> I didn't understand that. Krishna is so kind, you offer your food to Krishna, and if it's with, if your offering is with devotion, he accepts, and he leaves the food there for you. But the food is transformed by your offering into, it's transformed into spiritual nourishment, as well as nourishment for your body. Now, this may sound very religious or very mystical, but actually, uh, even in the business world today, persons are realizing in the food market that there is a special niche for, it's called food with embedded intentions. So there are persons who are bottling mineral water or producing chocolate and they have their employees as they're manufacturing or bottling or packaging this food. They have their employees all gather around and just aim good thoughts at the food. <laughs> <laughs> and they market it in that way. And they're hiring psychologists to try to actually do research and see that they're you do feel different by drinking a bottle of middle world that comes from a bottling plant where the employees are <laughs> focusing their highest intentions on. By offering food to Krishna with devotion, it's not just a mental platform activity. Krishna actually transforms the food. Yes. Everyone is 
is entitled to participate in this reality of tasting Krishna through prasad, food offered to Krishna with love and devotion. Similarly, we can transform not simply not simply the food that we offer to Krishna, we can transform our whole life by offering to Krishna. That is the great gift of Bhagavad Gita. And therefore, Krishna says, upon getting this wealth, you'll realize there's no higher gain. And even in the greatest material difficulty, you'll never let this greatest gain go. But please, think about where your life is going. What is the wealth that you're pursuing? How you can use all aspects of your life for the highest attainment, the greatest treasure. That greatest treasure is being made so easy because Krishna has come as Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna in the guise of his own devotee, to show you how easily you can become Krishna conscious, how easily you can be a bhakti yogi, even in this intense materialistic day and age. All this treasure, all this wealth is accessible to us. Therefore, as we said in the beginning, it's a great tragedy that billions of human beings are wasting their lifestyle, wasting their time by pursuing rewards and fruits that will never satisfy. Even they may know Attaining wealth beyond a basic middle class standard of living will not satisfy you. But you can't rest in peace with that knowledge because the mode of passion in the atmosphere is so strong. You're pushed to go on striving, go on getting. People need a dose of transcendental medicine that will take them off this hedonic treadmill. The only way you'll agree to get off the hedonic treadmill is if you can be hooked up to something far superior. You have to endeavor. Krishna explains that in Bhagavad Gita. Nahikaschit chanamapi jatutishtachakam. Everyone has to act. No one can stop acting even for a single moment. So since we must act, the intelligent person learns from Bhagavad Gita what is the art of acting without reaction. We invite everyone to please partake in this highest art of science and culture. How to work without reaction. How to perform non-reactive activity. And Krishna promises you in Bhagavad Gita by connecting all your activities to him, the greatest treasure in life is yours. You revive your spiritual identity. You thrive in the spiritual relationship between you, the minute spirit soul, and Krishna, the supreme soul. Then your life is truly successful. Thank you very much.
Desire is something very subtle, like the fragrance of a flower. Desire, at its root, comes from independence. We have tiny independence. We are part of Krishna. Krishna has unlimited independence. We are his part. Therefore, we also have independence, but it's very tiny. Our independence, which manifests as desire, is to the extent that we can choose, shall I interact with Krishna's material energy or his spiritual energy? In other words, you choose which river you want to jump in. Once you jump into the river, you're carried away. That much independence you have. And based on that independence, you manifest desires. Krishna won't force you to love him. He wants that you aim your desires at him. There can be no love of Krishna if it's forced. So that's why we have the material world. It's a place where you can misuse your independence, have the wrong desires, and get the reactions. It doesn't have to be that. That's why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna invites you. Sarvadhamma Prachata Mame Prachata. Shut down your plan making factory. Shut down your desire business. <laughs> Take his plan and focus your desire on him. Yes. So say I'm uh, I'm really poor, right? And I'm not in middle class. So, so you, you're talking about we should love the rich almost and love the poor. Is that the right interpretation? I said that How Krishna is equally disposed to all statuses in life. In other words, we don't glorify the rich. We don't glorify the poor. We don't condemn the rich, we don't condemn the poor. Because, listen, because uh, whether you're rich or poor, you don't know what to do with your life. So that's what we are pointing out as a tragic mistake. How do we help the poor then if we don't identify with them? You have to understand, you must understand what the real poverty is. The real poverty is knowledge of what is the self, what is the supreme self, and the relationship between the two. Right. Uh, there's also, that's completely true. There's also a level of material well-being, like a basic standard, basic income, living wage so that, you know, I don't know if y'all are middle class or where you want to call them on the spectrum, but, you know, a poor person can have uh, an iPhone, but they might not know where they're sleeping the next day, right? So how do we get basic things like health care, uh, housing, and free education? How do we, how do we, so... Unless you have knowledge, you won't know what to do with whatever you have, whether it's a little or a lot. So yes, for example, there are one billion people approximately in this world who are not getting enough food to start. And there are one billion people in this world who have an obesity problem. So what we're looking at is a lack of knowledge, and therefore there's exploitation, there's misuse of resources. The real solution is to educate the population in their spiritual needs, their spiritual desires. Otherwise, they'll always be trapped on the material platform with material needs and material desires. And, and I see it happening here with uh, your, your community. You guys are educating each other, um, spreading the knowledge. But then at what point do we take action to actually say stop the tyrannies in all its various forms? First, we must stop the tyranny of our mind and senses. Unless you can control your mind and senses, you'll always be exploited. You'll be, not simply by the exploiter without, but by the exploitation of your own body and mind. So unless people can learn how to control their mind and senses, they'll always be oppressed and exploited by someone. It's just a question whether it's this one or that one. Just like I, I was explaining in South Africa. Okay, you're free from the apartheid system, so 
the ins became the outs, and now the outs are the ins, but everyone is still totally enslaved by their mind and senses. Yeah, that too, but they didn't, they didn't have actual uh, economic control of their lives. They gained political control, but the economic control means they still maintained that life. No. <laughs> Do the Americans have economic control of their lives? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so therefore, Political solutions and economic solutions are just superficial. We need to get to the root of the problem. Certainly, if I don't have clothes or don't have food and someone gives me proper clothes and proper food, I would be grateful, but I wouldn't think they have solved my main problem in mind. So that's what we're talking about today. All right? Thank you. Very good questions. Very good questions. These are questions I worried about during my university days. They, they seem spiritual too. As I was saying, these are questions I was so concerned with in my university days. My professors let me study whatever I wanted to because I told them I wanted to find a solution, a true solution to human problems. So they let me study anything. And they told me, okay, when your four years here are done and you find the perfect knowledge, the perfect solution to human problems, Please let us know. <laughs> of course, I didn't find such material knowledge that could solve human beings' problems. But after I graduated, I came upon the greatest education, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavad. And that's what I recommend for you, because you're actually concerned with the highest good, the highest welfare of the people. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.